Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke this evening. Luke chapter number 6, if you would. Luke chapter number 6 tonight is where we're going to be looking for our message. As I mentioned, I am looking forward to Missions Conference. It's always uh, been for me a very special thing. I surrendered to the ministry many years ago when I was just 10 years old in a missions conference. still remember that very, very vividly. Um, I can take you to this day to the, uh, the spot where I knelt at the front of the, uh, of the auditorium and felt like the Lord was calling me to do something with my life for Him and something uh, in the long lines of missions, I thought at the time. And I remember praying and and for me, I remember as a 10-year-old boy going home, I had to figure out right then where the Lord wanted me to be a missionary. And so I did what all 10-year-old boys do. And in 1993, I pulled down the Encyclopedia Britannica that we had and uh, started looking through the maps and tried to find a place I'd never heard of before. And I found this place called Togo, West Africa. I'd never heard of Togo, West Africa before in all my 10 years of experience, you know. And never knew of that, never heard of that. I was just sure that, you know, they didn't have any missionaries there since I hadn't heard of it. So that's where I was going to go. And uh, so for uh, several years, actually, that's uh, what I had in mind. I wanted to be a missionary pilot, actually. Can you imagine me flying a plane? Isn't that scary? Uh, and uh, was interested in, in that, but definitely knew that the Lord wanted me to serve Him. It was some years later, when I was uh, summer when I was 15 years old, the Lord refined my calling and directed me to prepared a pastor here in the States, but I've always had a love for missions, and uh, I've always uh, uh, been grateful for those who would go to a foreign place and, and to give their lives to share the gospel. Uh, but uh, as a pastor now, uh, for many years, um, this year actually marks 20 years since I started in the ministry, um, and uh, during the time the Lord's allowed me to minister, uh, my role has been as a pastor here in the States to encourage God's people and uh, in the church to, to uh, be involved in missions in many ways, uh, and among them would be through our giving, uh, through faith promise and grace giving uh, to missions. In the first church that I pastored, when I came there, uh, they only had one missionary. They supported them through the, through the general fund. There was no specific missions giving or missions program of any sort. And uh, the Lord uh, allowed us to be able to begin a, a Faith Promise Missions program there. And, uh, and by the time uh, we, uh, we had left there, we had, I think, uh, 13 or 14 missionaries that we supported uh, through Grace Giving. Um, and basically, five or six times uh, more money had been, was being given to missions through that. And that was a great blessing and a privilege to me to be able, able to be a part of. And of course, when the Lord called us here, uh, we came into a very different situation. It had a very well-established missions program. Um, and the Lord has allowed us to be able to maintain and build upon that in some ways. And, and I believe that it ought always to be our goal as a church to not only get the gospel out here in our own community, uh, but to be involved in getting the gospel out all over the world. And one of the primary ways that we do that, as I said, is through our giving financially. And uh, so no doubt you'll hear a little bit about that this coming weekend. Uh, as our missionaries are in and we talk about missions and what we can do, certainly we're going to be considering um, our uh, commitment to Faith Promise Grace Giving Missions. Uh, and we'll be talking more about that this coming Sunday. Um, but tonight I kind of want to prime the pump, if you will. And I want to talk about the fruitfulness of giving to missions. The fruitfulness of giving to missions. And I want us to begin with Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It's really going to be our text verse for the night. We're going to kind of dissect this a little bit. And then at the end, we're going to make a particular application uh, to giving to missions. But Luke chapter 6, verse number 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet... With all, it shall be measured to you again. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, Lord, you have been so generous to us. You have given us, most importantly, your Son, so that we might be saved, so that we can enter into a relationship with you. But then every single day, you, you load us with benefits. 
And we have the privilege of living in one of the most prosperous nations in history. And Lord, I pray that we would not take all of these blessings for granted, nor would we be selfish and stingy with them. But Lord, that we would reflect Your own generosity in ours, being willing to give generously and to give sacrificially, especially that we might fund the work of the gospel around the world. Teach us from Your Word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 6.38 gives us some principles about generosity in general. Biblical generosity is the willingness to give selflessly and sacrificially. If we're being truly generous, then we are not giving in order to get something in return. As it's been often said, we don't give to get, we get to give. That should be our attitude, to give out of a sincere desire to be a blessing to others and to glorify God. But there are many places in Scripture where God promises to bless those who are generous. And that blessing, many times, can take the form of material blessings. And the verse we've just read is one of many of those places where the Scripture tells us that if we are generous and we give, that God will see to it that we are given back to. Now I know because we have to counter the modern heresy of the prosperity gospel that sometimes we're hesitant even to approach verses like this. But it is just as much a part of Scripture as any part. And it's the truth. And this verse contains both a principle and a promise from God that we need to be reminded of tonight and we need to put in practice in our life. And as we talk about generosity, I believe one of the best places to demonstrate generosity is in our giving to missions, to fund the work of the gospel around the world. As we give to fund that work, to give the gospel to those who've never heard. We should be encouraged by promises like these that we find here in Luke 6.38 because God has promised to bless those who give generously, especially those who give generously to missions. Notice, first of all, the command that is given here in Luke 6.38. The very first word of the verse, separated from the rest of the verse by that little comma, is the word give. And this word is in the imperative, meaning that it is a command. Jesus here is not giving a speculation or if this happens, this will happen kind of an idea. But rather, Jesus is saying to His disciples, you give. That is a command, an instruction from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are commanded as His followers to be givers. There are many places in the Bible we could go to to confirm this, but one that comes to my mind is 2 Corinthians 9.7. It says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You know, the world thinks that the idea of generosity is utter foolishness. The world says that if you want the most out of life, then you need to use your resources for yourself to get the most out of life. We live in a, a world that has a taker mentality, not a giver mentality. Most people are consumed with getting everything they can. As one fellow said, get everything you can, can everything you get, and sit on the can. That is very much the attitude of our world today. Many people are concerned about their own needs only and not the needs of others. They think of their needs as enormous and the needs of other people as minuscule. We have a society that tells us that we should get what we want and we should get it now. You shouldn't have to wait for it. You see it, you want it, you get it. And if you don't have the money, Visa or MasterCard will help you. That's the mentality of our world today. The result of this taker mentality is discontentment all around us. Our modern marketing is all driven by a, a, a desire, a, 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 an intention to make you discontent with what you have. 
I know you just bought the latest smartphone last fall, but there's a newer and better one now. One you have is not good enough, sorry. Your car is not good enough anymore. You got to get a new one. Preferably one that plugs in, right? Nothing against electric cars, Dr. Alman. No. Fine with that. Whatever you have, your clothes, not good enough. You know, your house, you can do better than that. And all of our society seems to be telling us that what we have isn't good enough. So we need to use what resources we have to get bigger and better resources. And we get caught in this big, giant rat race that's nothing more than a huge source of frustration because it never satisfies. People are incontent and thus they are ungrateful for what they do have. And so they try to accumulate more and more stuff to kind of soothe the irritation of their ingratitude and their discontent. We live in a culture here in America that's literally addicted to stuff. Have you ever thought about this? How much stuff we have? My family has moved a number of times. I've lost track at the moment. I can't tell you exactly how many times that we've moved. Lane, is it nine times since we've been married? Something like that? Ish. And every time we move, I have the same question. Where did all this junk come from? It's like it just, it just appears out of nowhere. We have stuffitis, right? And, you know, the American way to do it now is you, you buy a house with a big garage and then you cram the garage full of junk and park your expensive car outside in the driveway. And then you rent a storage building because you can't fit all your junk in your garage. I mean, that's just, that's the society we live in. And in this kind of a society, it's easy for us to be consumed with the taker mentality instead of obeying God's command to give, to be generous. We have to look at others and ask the question, what can I give to them? Because it's only in giving that we can have true joy. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Boy, that goes right against the grain of our carnal flesh, does it not? Our flesh wants to receive. Gimme, gimme, gimme. But Jesus said, no, it is more blessed. That is, it makes you more happy. It will give you more true joy to be a giver than to be receiving. Keep your finger in Luke chapter 6 and turn over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Part of our problem is, is we need to reset our mindset about giving. What it is that we're actually doing when we give. Because if we have an earthly mindset, if we're just looking at to whom we're giving, we may think, well, that person's not worthy of my gift. That cause is not worthy of my gift. But when we have an upward perspective, and we view our giving not as just giving to that individual, but giving to the Lord through that individual, it changes things. 1 Timothy 6 Notice verses 17 through 19. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now what I want to point out to you from these verses, and that, that in the context of giving monetarily, which is what verse 18 is talking about when it says ready to distribute and willing to communicate. It's talking about giving money. It's talking about those who are rich in this world, which by the way, most of us, if not all of us in this room, fall into the category of rich in this world. I'm just talking about purely from the statistics. If you look at what we own and what we have, what we possess as Americans versus the rest of the world, we are wealthy. We are wealthy. And it's talking about giving monetarily. It says in verse number 19 that if you do that, you are laying up in store for yourself a good foundation against the time to come that you may lay hold on eternal life. Giving of your money can be an investment in eternity if it is given 
with the right heart and for the right purpose. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt nor thieves do not break through and steal. We're not supposed to lay up treasures on earth. We are supposed to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Well, how do we do that? Well, we invest things the same way you lay up treasures here. You invest there are many things that we can invest. We can invest our time. We can invest our talents. We can invest our energy. But certainly we do and we should invest our money, not only as a good steward here on earth, but in eternal things as well. We are commanded to give. And there's an irony in Scripture about giving, an irony that the world doesn't understand. In fact, they think it's foolish. And it's this. According to the Bible, the more you give, the more you have. Now that doesn't, that doesn't compute to the, uh, mathematically. You know, when you were in, uh, in elementary school learning your you know, basic arithmetic, you probably had a word problem like this. Johnny has three apples. He gives two apples to Susie. How many apples does Johnny have left? One apple. Right? So if you give more, then you have less. Mathematically, that's the way we look at it, but scripturally, that's not the case. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25, there is that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is that withholdeth more than his meat, but attendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. What are these verses saying? It's saying that people who hold loosely to their earthly possessions and give generously will find that they receive more in return than they give out. This is the principle of Scripture, and I know to our business minds it just doesn't make sense. But God says that's the case. I remember some years ago I was driving down the road and I often notice and pay attention to church signs. Some of them are amusing, some of them are annoying. But occasionally, every once in a while, one really catches my interest and I remember it. And I remember seeing this one particular sign and all it said was, be a fountain, not a drain. And I thought, man, that is a, that is a really good way to look at it. When it comes to, especially as we're talking about giving to missions, we should be want, our desire should be to be a fountain, a source of blessing, instead of constantly just taking in the blessings ourselves. So there's a command here to be a giver. But back in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, we find a promise connected with it. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. So this is a conditional promise in this verse, at least. It's talking about being given to us in response to our obedience of giving to others. God promises to give back to those who live generously. Now, we should not have any, any, any qualms about discussing this. Even though there are those who distort the truth of Scripture and the prosperity gospel says it's all about getting, we should not be hesitant to claim the promise of God that God says if we give, He will give back to us. God never promises that we will be wealthy by the world's standard. We're not saying that. We're certainly not going to go down that road and say, well, if you will give God your seed gift of $100, God will bless you tenfold and you'll get $1,000 back and you, know, you, you can drive that brand new Lamborghini you want if you'll just have enough faith. That's not what we're talking about because that's not scriptural. That's just covetousness and greed that's cloaked in religious garb, if you will. But the clear promise of Scripture is that if we give generously, God will give back to us. What that means is that God says we will always have enough and often more than enough. Some other places in Scripture where this principle is given such as Deuteronomy 15 and verse 10, Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, 
and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. You know what that verse is saying? God is saying we need to give generously to those who are in need and we ought not be grudged that. We ought not be grieved by that because when we do that, it says that God will bless us in our works and all that we put our hand to. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. This is how this, this irony of Scripture works. That if you give more, you have more. It's because if you're giving with the right heart and for the right reason, God gives back to you way more than you would have ever had had you hoarded everything for yourself. That doesn't compute with the world system. And listen, even Dave Ramsey doesn't have a calculator that can show you what kind of return on investment you get for investing in eternity. Look, I'm thankful for the Christian financial gurus, but I'm, I've listened to a lot of them and I've read a lot of them and there seems to be a lack of emphasis and many times on the willingness to give generously. And I think we need to emphasize that. Because we cannot calculate it and because we can't figure out on paper how this works, oftentimes we're stingy instead of generous. You know, when you hold on to something, you can count that. You can say, I've got this much. And if something goes out and comes back in, you can count it as it goes. But there are ways that God blesses us that you and I cannot quantify. We can't count it in dollars and cents. But still, we like to be like Scrooge, you know. We like to hoard it. We like to hold on to it. We like to count it. We like to know it's there. And, but it never really brings us any happiness because we always want more. J.D. Rockefeller, who was uh, one of the wealthiest men of his day, was asked one time how much more wealth he wanted. And his answer was simply a little more, a little more. Because that's what, the, that's what money does. It leaves you wanting a little more. It's, all, it's never going to be enough. Solomon, one of the wealthiest men that ever lived, one of the, the wisest men of his day, one of the wisest men perhaps other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisest man. And you know what he found out about money? The more you have, the more you have to worry about. It didn't satisfy. It was vanity, just like all of his other ways that he was searching for happiness here in this world. He found out it was just vain. And so if we're trying to calculate the fulfillment of this prophecy with dollars and cents, we may not be able to do that. But that's why we need to let God be our accountant. Let Him balance the books. Now, some people have the idea of when they approach their giving to missions that they're going to, um, they're going to keep track of it on paper and they're only going to give what makes sense on paper. And I believe that maybe as a first step in giving to missions, that would be a good first step to take. But I think we need to get beyond that. We need to be willing to give what does not make sense. It says of the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that they gave beyond their power. What does that mean? It means they gave more than they should have been able to give. And it was a level of giving that could only be sustained by the grace of God. It, they could only do it if God was going to supernaturally meet their needs so that they could continue to give. When we talk about the fulfillment of this promise, we can't say that if you put $100 in the offering for missionaries, God's going to give you $101 back or quantify it anyway. Now, I'm so thankful that many times God does that kind of thing. I've heard so many testimonies and I've had so many of my own of where the Lord has given me monetarily Money that sh just shouldn't have been given. It, it had, there was no reason for it other than God was just blessing me. But you know what? There are so many other ways that God can provide for us and God can give to us other than that. We need to be willing to give and we need to be willing to take God at His word that He will give back to us. Joy and happiness does not come by hoarding what we have. It comes by being obedient to God's command, living generously, and trusting in God's supply. But then number three, notice the abundance here that Jesus speaks of. Jesus says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, 
shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Notice this, this picture here is, is uh, kind of the, uh, the idea of if you had a basket that you were trying to uh, fill with something like grain. Maybe you had gone to into, into the market and you were going to get, uh, get a bushel of grain. And so you went to the grain merchant and you, uh, you had your bushel basket uh, and the grain merchant gets his scoop and he starts filling it up and he would fill it to the point where it would be kind of level with the top of the basket. That would you, be what you could say a good measure. But you know what? There's still room in there. Because you know what you can do? You can shake that basket around a little bit and it'll settle some. And you can press it down and tamp it and it'll compact it some. And you know what? Now you got room for more. And so he can scoop some more on there. And if you are a frugal person and you want your money's worth, you're going to make sure that he fills it until there's absolutely no more room for anything else because everything's just running over the side. That's the picture here that Jesus uses to describe how God will give back to us, not just a little bit, but as much as we can hold. Not just enough, more than enough. And isn't it interesting that it says that this will be done through other men? Shall men give unto your bosom? Through the generosity of others, God will repay you for your generosity. Again, this is a principle repeated so many times in Scripture in so many different places. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Not, notice here the abundance of blessing. That God would pour out so much on us that we would not even be able to contain it all. You know, part of living a generous life is recognizing that everything we have comes from God anyway. And we're just stewards of it for a little while, and so we ought to give as He wants us to. But then also continually recognizing that everything that we receive comes from the Lord. Every good gift... And every perfect gift cometh from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So God promises an abundant blessing for those who obey His command to give. Sometimes it comes in the form of prosperity where things are added to us. But then there's another way that God prospers us and provides for us. And that is through prevention. Malachi 3.11 goes on to mention that when it says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. And that is a provision and a blessing that we can't measure. How can you measure what you might have lost if you hadn't obeyed? You can't measure that. But yet when we obey, we give as God commands us, God blesses us in every way. God wants to bless you. I believe God wants to bless us materially even. But we have to be obedient in order to receive that blessing. Jeremiah 5.25 says, Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholding good things from you. If we simply obey God, God will abundantly bless us. And then finally from Luke 6.38, notice the principle here. The, the verse concludes... For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. The word meet there, M-E-T-E, means give out. So basically it's saying that however generous you are, is how generous others will be with you. How much generosity you receive will be proportionate to the generosity that you show. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 for... Just a second, as, as we look at this passage here where Paul is talking to a, a group of believers, the Corinthian church, who had made a commitment to give an offering to some needy believers down in Jerusalem and had not kept their commitment yet. He's encouraging them to give. He uses the example of the Macedonian believers who in their great poverty and their trial of affliction, they gave generously, gave beyond their power. 
And he's encouraging the Corinthians now to follow through, to prove their love, and give as they said they, they would give. And in this context, he says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. I found something out as I've been gardening for a few years now. As a general rule, the more I plant, the more I get. Some years ago, uh, back in North Carolina, we decided to plant half of our garden just in sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes did good there. They were relatively low maintenance. And so uh, we planted a patch, uh, I guess about 40 by 45, of sweet potatoes. We got over 200 pounds of sweet potatoes that year. Why? Because we planted a whole lot of sweet potatoes. We had a fellow in our church at the same time. Uh, he had a good-sized garden plot. I don't know exact dimensions, but I would guess it's probably about, you know, 40 by 75, something like that. Had 13 long rows in it, and he decided one year he was going to plant them all in okra. 13 rows, 70 foot long or so, of okra. Every Sunday they came in with grocery bags full of okra. I like okra if it's cooked right. And by cooked right, I mean fried hard and crispy. <laughs> How did he get so much okra? He planted a lot of okra. He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now verse 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And notice verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. See, what God promises here is that if you will give generously, God will make sure you always have enough. Always. And often more than enough. You might not be able to show it on paper. It might not make sense to the accountants of this world. It might not add up for your banker. But there are benefits that you will receive that are far more valuable than dollars. And I believe that this is particularly true in the context of giving to missions. One more passage I'd like for you to look at with me. It's in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. It's very likely that the Philippians who were in Macedonia were the ones that Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Because he talks about the Philippians and how they gave to him. Philippians 4 verse 15, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Now notice what he says in verse 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. When you give to support the work of missions through Philadelphia Baptist Church, you are investing in eternity. That's why I like our model of missions giving so much because every dollar that is given to missions is used only for missions. We don't pay the power bill from that. We don't fix the building up. We don't pay salaries out of that. We don't do anything else with that money except give to missionaries. When you give to missions, you are investing in eternity. Paul says that the money that the Philippians gave to him would result in fruit that would be credited to their account. What is the fruit that he's talking about? It's the fruit of souls saved. That is the eternal reward that we get. Think about this. Some, some traders will try to make money using currency exchange. You take American dollars and you buy some other form of currency with it. You wait until the currency values offset and then you cash them back in the other way and you can make money on that sometimes. Currency exchange. This is the greatest currency exchange in history. You can trade American dollars for eternal souls. Think about that. I mean, the dollar 
still very strong and as far as the world's economic system goes you know it's it's a good investment to have American dollars but as we have seen the value of a dollar can change drastically a dollar today does not buy what a dollar a year ago bought and we can go back farther and farther and realize that the dollar's value has has gone down but you can trade that dollar and invest it in a soul think about that what greater investment could there be than to invest in eternity by giving to reach people with the gospel souls are our reward for giving to missions Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, What is our hope or joy of crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? Paul said that's our reward right there. There are people that have been saved. Financial gifts. Paul calls them a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing unto God. Giving to support those who are sharing the gospel pleases the Lord. With the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. You know, I cannot tell you that if you give more to missions in this coming year, that you will have more at the end of that 12 months in your bank account than you did when you started. I cannot say uh, that your investment portfolio will have grown by a certain percent. Nowhere does God say that you will become materially wealthy if you give a certain amount of money. But what God does say is that if you give generously, He will see to it that you are shown generosity. On the other hand, if you are stingy and selfish and you hoard what God has given you, what you will find is nothing more than continual discontentment, dissatisfaction, and a consuming desire to want more and more. God says if you give, that you will always have enough and often more than enough. And there is no better guarantee than God's guarantee. There's no better investment than to invest in eternity. And giving to missions is a great way to do that. Let's be willing to give. Let's be willing to give generously. And let's be willing to take God at His word that He will give back abundantly. Heavenly Father, as we bow before You this evening, we're grateful for the promises of Your word. Thankful, Lord, that You have shown us the ultimate example of generosity because You so loved the world that You gave Your only begotten Son. And Lord, as we consider our own involvement in missions through our giving. I pray that our hearts would be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit and willing to take yet another step to do more than we've ever done, to give selfishly and sa selflessly and sacrificially in order to reach the world with the gospel. And Lord, that you would be glorified by our commitment and our faithfulness in following through to give what you lay on our hearts. I pray that the missions program of Philadelphia Baptist Church would continue to thrive. And Lord, I pray that souls would be saved. And I ask it in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask my wife to play number 539, Rescue the Perishing. And here's what I want to invite you to do as she plays. I want to invite you to go to the Lord in prayer and right now, ask the Lord to give you wisdom and guidance as you consider how much you should commit to give to missions. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be renewing our commitments. And I believe that it is time for us to do more than we've ever done. But I can't tell you how much that is for you. Only God can tell you that. 
And so you need to have that conversation with Him. I want to invite you to begin that conversation now.